Hello, thank you for watching and welcome to the next video in my series on basic statistics. Now as usual, a few things before we get started. Number one, if you're watching this video because you are struggling in a class right now, I want you to stay positive and keep your head up. If you're watching this, it means you've accomplished quite a bit already. You're very smart and talented and you may have just hit a temporary rough patch. Now I know with the right amount of hard work, practice, and patience, you can get through it. I have faith in you, many other people around you have faith in you, so so should you. Number two, please feel free to follow me here on YouTube, on Twitter, on Google+, or on LinkedIn. That way when I upload a new video, you know about it. And it's always nice to connect with people who watch my videos online. The world is much too large and life is much too short not to take the opportunity to connect with one another. Number two, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Share it with classmates or colleagues or put it on a playlist because that does encourage me to keep making them for you. On the flip side, if you think there is something I can do better, please leave a constructive comment below the video and I will try to take those ideas into account when I make new ones for you. And finally, just keep in mind that these videos are meant for individuals who are relatively new to stats. So I'm just going over basic concepts and I will be doing so in a very slow, deliberate manner. Not only do I want you to know what's going on, but also why and how to apply it. So, all that being said, let's go ahead and get started. So this video is the next in our series on hypothesis formulation, and now, finally, hypothesis testing. So up to this point, we've talked about what a hypothesis is, we talked about the null hypothesis, we talked about the alternative hypothesis, we talked about type 1 error and type 2 error with many, many examples. So all those were leading up to this very topic, and that is actually conducting a hypothesis test. Now there are many types of hypothesis test, but we're going to do the most simple in this video. And that is where we have a single sample with a known sigma or we have a single sample, we're testing against a hypothesized mean, and we are given sigma, which is the population standard deviation. So we'll go over several distribution curves, we'll talk about critical values and how that affects our alpha level and things like that, and then we will walk through two real world examples. So all that being said, let's go ahead and dive right in. Now it's very important to point out that hypothesis tests follow a very prescribed procedure. Now as usual, it always starts with a well-developed, clear research problem or analytical question. If the problem is poorly thought out, if what you're trying to accomplish is unclear, then no amount of statistics is going to be able to solve that. And it can actually make it worse. So always think through what you're trying to find out at the problem stage. Now once you have that, we always establish our hypotheses, both the null and the alternative. So remember the null and the alternative are complete opposites of each other and they must account for all possible outcomes. Then we determine the appropriate statistical test and sampling distribution. So as I said before, there are many types of hypothesis tests. So in this one, we're going to be looking at the Z test and other ones we might look at the T test and there are more still after that. Then of course, the sampling distribution will depend on whether or not we have Sigma given to us or we know it or we have to estimate it. So step three is always determine the appropriate statistical test and the sampling distribution. Then we choose our type 1 error rate. So what comfort level do we have with making a type 1 error? Is it 5%, 1%, 10%? Again, it will just depend on what our study asks for and what we are comfortable with. It all also has to do with what level of type 2 error we are comfortable making. Because remember, they are inversely related. Then we state our decision rule. So in this case, we're going to come up with a Z statistic 
and then we will have to determine whether or not, based on that Z statistic, we're going to reject our null hypothesis or fail to reject our null hypothesis. Then, and only then, do we go out and gather our sample data. So I know a lot of students I've worked with are really excited about going out and collecting data the very first thing. But I always have to say, no. Always form your research question or your analytical question first. Set up your hypothesis so you know what you're actually going at. And then you know, choose your test, your distribution, your error rate, decision rule, etc. Then go out and get your data. So there is this impulse to want to go out and collect data first and then form the research question based on the data you collected. No, it's the other way around. Always form your question first. Now once we have the data, we calculate our test statistics. So in this case, it will be the Z statistic. Now based on those test statistics, we will state our statistical conclusion. So we'll have a statistic to then compare to our decision rule. And then however our statistic compares to the decision rule will be our conclusion. And then finally, in the real world, we can either make a decision or an inference based on that conclusion. So it may be some research question in a journal we're looking at. It may be a policy in our business we are looking at. It may be some analytical work we are doing maybe in the financial industry or in the insurance industry or in the production industry, whatever it might be. So we finally get to the point where we can make a decision or some policy recommendation based on our conclusion. Now, as I said, there are really two types of these statistical tests. There are ones where we know sigma and ones where we don't. So as with confidence intervals, there are two types of single sample hypothesis tests. When the population standard deviation sigma is known or it's given to us, and when the population standard deviation sigma is not known, and therefore we have to estimate it using S, the sample standard deviation. Now when sigma is known or given to us, we use the normal standard or the Z distribution to establish the non-rejection region and the critical values in our sampling distribution. So again, we talked about that at great length when we looked at type one and type two error rates. So if you're still unsure what this concept is, go back and look at those videos. But when we know sigma, we're gonna use the normal standard or the Z distribution to establish these regions. Now when sigma is not known, we will use the T distribution instead. Because remember, the T distribution is a little bit shorter in the middle and it has a little bit more probability in the tails to account for that unknown or that estimation we're doing with the standard deviation of our population. Now, some instructors in some books will indicate that using the Z distribution is acceptable any time the sample size is 30 or greater, whether or not you know sigma or not. Now, I prefer to go ahead and use the T distribution anytime I do not know sigma. Now, remember, the reality is, is that as sample size increases, the Z distribution and the T distribution actually converge. So it just depends on what your instructor or your book is asking you to do. Because the T distribution, with its fatter tails, will actually change a little bit how the alpha level affects your critical values. Now it's always good to check the sample data for normality. Better safe than sorry. So you might want to look at a histogram or a QQ plot or a PP plot of your sample data to make sure it's not skewed heavily in one direction. You don't have any really crazy outliers or whatever else that might be. It's just always good to check your data for normality. So remember, what we're talking about here is the hypothesized versus the true mean. So mu is the true mean of the population under analysis. So if we're analyzing a population, it actually has a real world true mean. Now mu sub zero is the hypothesized mean of the population under analysis. So we might have some guess 
or some previous study or something else we are testing it against. So we're testing two means. We're testing our data's mean, the actual population mean, versus some hypothesized value we think it is. So what we're asking here, is the true mean the same as the hypothesized mean? Are they coming from the same distributions? Now we will test that question or this question using sample means, of course, and confidence intervals, which we'll call critical regions here in a minute. Now let's just remind ourselves about the two-tailed test rejection region. So here we have our two hypotheses as we had before. And then in this case, we're going to choose an alpha of 0 0.05. So we have our distribution, our sampling distribution, that looks like this. Now remember what we're actually saying here. With an alpha of 0 0.05, we are saying that this blue area in the middle is 95%. Now 95% of what? Well, what we're saying is that 95% of our sample means that we would take should be within this blue region. And then we risk 5% being outside that region. Now our hypothesized mean is set here in the middle. And we call this blue region the non-rejection region. And on the ends and the tails, those are both rejection regions. Now our alpha, in this case, is spread evenly among both tails. So our alpha of 0 0.05, we have 0 0.025 in the lower tail and 0 0.025 in the upper tail. So that's 2.5% in the lower, 2.5% in the upper tail. Now dividing the non-rejection region and the rejection region, it's called the critical value. It's kind of that boundary between the two. Now remember, the critical value is determined by alpha, in this case 0 0.05, and if we are using the T or the Z distributions. With an alpha of 0 0.05 and sigma known, we would consult the Z table and find the corresponding Z scores for a two-tailed test with the alpha of 0 0.05. Now when we do that, we see that our Z critical values are negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. So that z-score is the boundary between the non-rejection region and the rejection region based off our z-table and our alpha. And again, we're using the z-table because we know our sigma. Now what if we change the alpha level to 0.10? So we had 0 0.05, now we have an alpha of 0 0.10, which is twice that previous alpha. Now if you look at our tails, something should be fairly obvious right off the bat. Our rejection regions are larger, and our non-rejection region is smaller or narrower. Now we are saying that 90% of our sample means should be in the blue, in the non-rejection region. Therefore 10% would be in the tails, in the rejection region, either above or below. So now we have an alpha divided by 2 of 0 0.05. So that's 5% in the lower tail and 5% in the upper tail. Now as far as critical values go, are they going to become smaller or larger? Well, they're going to become smaller because the critical values moved inward. because We have less probability there in the middle, so it has to move inward. So our Z critical values are now negative 1.645 and positive 1.645. So what happens when our alpha level increases? So in this case we went from 0.05 to 0 0.10. Our non-rejection region gets smaller in the middle and the rejection regions in the tails get larger. And of course our critical values move inward. So finally, let's look at what happens to our critical values when we use an alpha of 0 0.01. So in the previous slide, we looked at an alpha of 0 0.10. So now this is 0 0.01. So let's make some predictions about what's going to happen here. Well, you notice that our non-rejection region in the middle is much wider. There's much more area there in the blue. 
Now, the reason that is is because we have to take this 0 0.01, or 1%, and divide it evenly among both tails. So we have 0 0.005, or one half of 1% in the lower tail, and we have 0 0.005, or one half of 1% in the upper tail. So what we're saying is that we expect 99% of our sample means to be in this non-rejection region, in the blue region in the middle. And of course, in the tails, that is our rejection region. And we expect 1% of our sample means to either be in the upper or the lower rejection region. Now, of course, the whole point of these series of slides is to talk about what happens to our critical values. So what's going to happen to our critical values with a very, very small alpha of 0.01? It's going to get larger or smaller. Well, the critical values are going to get larger. So here we have plus or minus 2.576. And those are by far the largest values, or you can think of them as the widest values, of all the alphas we have used. So the overall point of these last few slides is to look at the relationship between alpha and the area of our non-rejection region in the middle, our rejection regions on the ends, and the effects of the critical value as it sets the demarcation or the boundary between these two regions. So what are we really asking in sort of real world language? What we're asking is, did our sample come from the same population we assume is underlying the null hypothesis? So if we take a sample from a population to use in our Z statistic, we want to make sure we're testing whether or not our sample came from the population we are hypothesizing it came from. Now, if so, then we expect our sample mean to be inside the critical region, either 90% of the time, 95% of the time, or 99% of the time, depending on what we choose for alpha. That's what we are really asking. Is our sample mean from the same population we are hypothesizing it to be coming from? So let's go ahead and look at the actual z-test for a single mean. So here is our formula. Now it is comprised of x bar, which is the sample mean, mu sub zero, which is the hypothesized population mean given in our problem. Sigma is the population standard deviation. Again, that's a given or a known to us in this case. And n, of course, is the sample size, as it always is. Now, if you remember from the previous videos, this denominator is a very special term. It is the standard error of the mean, which is another name for the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So the standard error of the mean is the standard deviation of a distribution of many, many, many samples. So, you may see it written like this. So, sigma sub x bar is the same thing as it's written over here on the left. They're both representations of the standard error of the mean. So, I just wanted to show you both ways, depending on whatever class you're in or whatever book you're using, you might see it either way. Now, the question we are asking when we find this z statistic is, is this z test value in the non-rejection region in the middle, or is it in the rejection region in the tails? So one of the other tails, depending on how our hypothesis is set up. And that's what we're doing when we do a Z test.